Thanks for coming. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm a huge opera fan, so this is a real nice outlier from covering financial crises. <laughs> um, on the far side of the stage here is Peter Gelb. He's going to be starting on his 10th season as general manager of the Metropolitan Opera. This is the country's largest performing arts organization. It's not just the country's, it's one of the largest in the world when you look at their budget. It's really astounding. During his tenure, he has embarked on numerous initiatives designed to make opera more accessible, including the new live and HD series that he started, which means that opera gets broadcast to movie theaters all over the world, 70 different countries. And he's also begun uh, to try to get tickets to people who normally can't get them through targeted audience development. And then also an enhanced commitment to contemporary and modern opera. There is some, yes. We're going to hear about it, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and trying to enliven uh, well-known productions with new sets and new directors uh, to try to, to bring in more new audience members. And then we have a woman who I've seen perform many times, including at La Donna del Lago and Carnegie Hall earlier this year, Grammy Award-winning mezzo-soprano Joyce DiDonato, acclaimed for her performances as the, in the world's leading opera houses. She's also dubbed the queen of social media for opera. Yay, so that's perfect to have you here today. And she's currently starring in the Met in the company's first ever performance of Rossini's La Donna del Lago, which will be transmitted live to 2,000 movie theaters around the world on March 14th. So get your tickets. And then, yes. <laughs> Composer N Nico Muli, whose numerous works include the opera Two Boys, which was performed at the Met back in 2013. And he's got a forthcoming Met commissioned opera, Marnie, based on the 1961 novel that most of you probably haven't read, but you probably saw the movie by Alfred Hitchcock. Um, so you're an opera composer, but also, He's done lots of collaborations with Bork, The National, Grizzly Bear, Jonesy. So this is great to have you all here. Thank you. Peter, I'm going to start with you. This is about opera in the 21st century. A lot of the operas that we see are three and 400 years old. I mean, do we really need to think about opera in the 21st century? Somebody stands on a stage, they sing, there's a... What, what's different? Well, Michelle, the key to uh, keeping opera alive as an art form, and it is very much alive on the stage of the Met, is through the uh, vibrant performers uh, like Joyce, and through new compositional uh, new compositions from great composers like like Nico, uh, and in constantly trying to reinvent, uh, like any art form should, reinvent what we have, uh, re rearrange it uh, in terms of new productions. Uh, encouraging uh, new talents to, we, we search around the world for the greatest young opera stars. So we hope that we'll find the next Joyce DiDonato. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's all about uh, making it an exciting theatrical experience for an audience today. And at the same time, you know, we have an older audience, so we have to, uh, it's, it, it's, the challenges of opera are very much similar to the challenges of any institution that's been around a long time. The Met's been around for 131 years. So we have to both serve tradition and also break new ground. And that's what we do every day at the Metropolitan Opera. And how do you think you've done that when it comes to bringing opera into the 21st century? Well, I think bringing it into the 21st century means to me, uh, artistically, working with the best uh, directors and designers to present, whether, even if it's an opera that was written 400 years ago or 300 years ago, to make it feel like a contemporary piece, to make it feel uh, emotionally, theatrically, uh, relevant for an, for an audience today. Just as, you know, uh, if you go to see a, a new production of, of Hamlet or, or Macbeth, if you expect it to be successful, it has to speak to the audience in contemporary terms, and that's what we're doing with opera as well. So Rigoletto set in Las Vegas in the 60s or 70s, for example, which right, they was, did. That was the production we did a couple of seasons ago, directed by Michael Mayer, who also is working with Nico on his next opera, uh, which is exactly right. We took... Uh, 15th century Mantua and moved it into 1960 Las Vegas of the Rat Pack. And uh, it was a big success for the audience. Even, even the old time opera lovers liked it. Yeah, that's true. Joyce, when you think about opera in the 21st century, are, are we overstating uh, the concern about whether or not it can move forward a, as an art form or uh, does it have to be reinvented? Well, I think we're actually answering that question on stages around the world and particularly at the Met as well because we are continuing to create new opera, case in point here. I've been involved in a number of ones as well. 
the, the funny thing is, even though this has been around for 400 years, let's take, for example, Traviata. When the curtain rose on that on the debut night, the Parisian audience actually saw themselves on the stage. It was a modern opera. Traviata told the story of that day. And I think it's thrilling to be able to, to do that for a 21st century piece. You know, I did Dead Man Walking um, by Jake Heggie. That's a piece that is actually happening in front of our eyes today. Death penalty, injustice, prison system, all of that. But at the same time, a story like Traviata, which is duty and love and sacrifice, it's relevant. We, we deal with those things every day in our own life. So we're a part of a business that we get to look back, we get to look forward, and we get to look in the mirror at the same time. So for me, the question of relevance is actually sort of a, a, a moot point. Of course it's relevant. It's us on the stage all the time. Nico, opera in the 21st century. I mean, I, you're, I, you're making it. I'm, 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 try, I'm trying to make some. Um, but one of the difficulties, is, as, as both Joyce and Peter have said, is that you have to engage with this long history of, of opera as a, as a traditional art form. And yes, it, 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 it was sort of revolutionary and, and holding the mirror up to the audiences of, of its day, but many people's entry point is to it as a sort of museum, right? It's this sort of obsession with obsession with the oldness of it. And so as Joyce said, it's about bringing that forward. And for me as a composer, of course, you study this process obsessively. So you study what, what are the ways in which something that's meant to be set in a mythological space, you know, on, on, by, by the banks of the Rhine, what are the ways in which that can speak to us now? And what are the contemporary stories that will do the same thing, that will, that will be sort of delicious and shocking and relatable um, and engaging? If I were you, I, I would be terrified because opera lovers can be very tough on new stuff, right? I mean, Peter, this is going to be one of your tough nights, but I was there opening night, Tosca. New, never mind a new opera, this was a new set, <laughs> okay? The audience booed and booed and booed. I mean, they take tradition very seriously. Are you frightened? No, um, and I think one of the great things about opera actually is that people love it so much that they're willing to go crazy for it. Um, and I think you, you find a sort of apathy in, no, I don't want to say apathy, but, but in what I do the rest of my life, which is write concert music, people are fine with it, it's fine. No one really cares. In, in opera, people really will actually bring pieces of, of rotting vegetables to the theater <laughs> in anticipation, right? <laughs> It's an amazing thing, and, it, and it, or they'll arrange to sit next to other people who are planning to dislike it, and you think, well, that's actually great, right? It's, it's, great to ha it's great to be so passionate about a thing that you feel like you need to defend it, that you feel like you need to say, Tosca for me is so this thing that the fact of this concrete wall means I'm going to take 10 minutes out of my day to boo. It's, it's a beautiful thing. There's, there's, a, there's a double standard, though, in all of this, in that, in that um, Nico, as a composer of new opera, gets a free pass from the older audiences that are ready to boo any modern production of an opera that they've grown up with, like, like Tosca. So, so for him, they, they have, as long as he writes as beautifully as he does, um, and because he's writing about contemporary subjects, mostly, uh, it, the audience has a much more, even the older audience, as well as the new audience, which goes out to hear Nico, the older audience has a much more open mind about what he is doing. How did you come to decide that you were going to mount an opera, two boys, based on the internet? That was his idea, that was your idea, you had an idea about the internet, you commissioned, what was the process to get a new opera on the stage? I had a meeting with Nico, I think at the time was about 25 years old. He's the youngest composer to ever have his work uh, premiered on the stage of the Met. And, and I, I had, I had uh, just, just started at the Met, or had been there maybe a year or two, and I had a meeting with him in my office and I said, what do you want to compose? And he, has, he said he had two ideas. One of them was this internet idea. Right. And I said, which, which one, it was another idea, I forget the other one, it was. It was, a, it was I, I, I'm obsessed with these Welsh children's books by Susan Cooper, and I was like, well, we can't, can't we have a million Welsh children running around the set? And Peter said, no. Yeah. <laughs> actually, actually what, no, what I really said was, which, which one did you really want to do? Right. And he said the one he really wanted to do was the internet opera, which is about, uh, based on this uh, true, true events of a murder, or an attempted murder, of, uh, it was in an early chat room, uh, uh, debacle. I mean, when you think about what happens in, in the internet today, uh, this was kind of the forerunner of internet hate, uh, and uh, it's a it's a marvelous uh, kind of murder mystery that uh, he, he can. And, and murder is a mainstay of opera. Well, I was going to say, you know, one, one of the things that drew me to this story, which the, the short version is, um, a younger boy sort of 
pretends to be a lot of different people online in order to sort of ensnare an older boy. Um, they end up in this sort of violent confrontation and there's a policewoman who has to un unravel this. But for me, you know, putting on a disguise in order to trick someone is, is at the fundament of theater and at the fundament of most opera is, is this idea that when, you <coughs> excuse me, that when you're in your disguise, and we see this in Mozart, and we see this in Purcell, and we see this, you know, ever when you're in disguise, you're able to tell someone the actual truth, right? That it's through deceit that honesty actually happens, and this is so operatic. Joyce, they call you the queen of social media in the opera world. Tell me more, why? I mean, I know why, but, you know, tell the audience all the things that you do with YouTube. Well, you know, it's funny, it started off sort of pre-Google, <laughs> Like, did those days even really exist? And I had a friend who was saying, I think this was around 2005, and she said, Joyce, it, I think it's time that you get a website. I said, oh, God, no, I don't want a website. Oh, it's all pictures of me and schedule of me and me, 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 me. I was like, no. And she said, no, really, people are going to want to be able to find out more about you. And I said, oh, okay. Well, the only way I want to do it is if I really write something of substance on there. So if people do happen on there... They're not just learning about me, they're learning about opera, they're learning about theater. And I started writing, I called it a journal at the time because blogs didn't yet exist. And I've really been improvising my way around it. I'm not a tech guru. I mean, being here in the AOL building, this is the hippest I've right? ever felt. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> you guys, it's so cool here. Um, but I'm really improvising. I'm just keeping my nose out. And the thing that keeps me doing it I'm trying to find the balance between self-promotion and giving information about this incredible world, which is, Nico was saying, people are so passionate about it and they're crazy. They want to absorb everything they can. I want to focus primarily on encouraging young singers and helping fill in some of the gaps for the audience to understand why is it so complicated? Why is it so expensive? Why is it so convoluted at times? And... I keep getting amazing response back from people. So I think that just keeps fueling it for me. What's happening backstage, what the process is about, nerves of opening night, all of that. And, and I think it, there's a real audience out there for it. And what does that social engagement do for you and for opera, do you think? I get a lot of young kids at the stage door waiting for my signature, which is not necessarily what we expect in opera houses. Um, I get a lot of kids writing to me and telling me how their auditions went. I have audience so members. Sweet. I know, I know. Because I that seems like five minutes ago for me when I didn't get the audition. Um, I have also audience members writing and saying I had no idea what went into creating a role. And it's I find it's the thing with opera is it is complex and it the beautiful thing is that it takes an investment on the part of the audience. And that's not always an easy thing to find today where people are willing to invest energy and time in it. But if they do, and if they can find resources that are not too daunting at first, you go into opera chat rooms and sometimes you think, oh God, this is a scary place. And, and I'm glad those exist because it fuels a lot for people. But I also want a safe place where people can come in and, and get really feel like they're starting to enter into the blood of the veins of this I, art form. I, I could add also, I mean, I, I'll, you're, not, not to embarrass you, but one of, one of the great things that, that Joyce does is that she has um, a really technical commitment to explaining what it is that you're doing with your voice, which I think is amazing because it's so, it's so easy because you make it look easy, and a lot of singers make it look easy to think, oh, well, basically, the life of an opera singer, it's like you take a bubble bath, and then you turn up on the stage, and you make this beautiful noise, and, and it's really not that... That's all. That's all, right, exactly, and then, then you go right back to the tub. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I want, there's a, a video of you doing a master class at probably at, at Juilliard, and you were like, let me stop you right here, she's saying to a younger singer, and let me, let's just talk about how to trill. Let's just talk about literally, technically how to do that. And it's like a three minute clip, but it's so beautiful because you realize, you know, okay, fine, like social media, you know, it's a picture of me, whatever, but actually at the end of the day, it's like, it's the nuts and bolts of it that's being, that's being explained really beautifully and generously. Thank you. I, I just tell you about a weekend I had two weekends ago. I was, um, doing a three-day intensive master class as part of my Carnegie Hall Perspective series. And we got Medici TV to stream the two-hour afternoon sessions all three days. And I went over all days. 
So it ended up being almost seven hours of live streamed television, video, unedited, unscripted. Are you practicing? No, I'm working with singers oh, as a master with singers. class. Okay. And I had four singers, and I worked with each of them all three days. At the end of those three days, maybe this doesn't sound a lot to AOL, but we had 68,000 views of people sitting for two hours in front of their computer watching live stream class where I'm talking about diction and trilling and all of this, but explaining behind the things. And it was people from not just opera lovers, but people from all walks of life. And what I find is if we can present it in a way that is open but detailed, I mean, actually showing the complexity, people are astounded and they're drawn in and they want to know more. So showing an a master class streaming, great, doing this streaming. Opera streaming, I mean, live versus on a screen, to me, it's just never as good, Peter. Any response to that? Or, is, or do you have to do that because it's so expensive, people can't get there, they can't commit to five hours some nights? Well, you know, when I first came to the Met, I was con uh, determined to try to make the Met more accessible and available to the public, and uh, this was, Nine, nine years ago, and I, so what I, I was really concerned that the Met, uh, as, a fam as famous a landmark as it is in New York City at the, at the center of Lincoln Center, uh, was a place that most people had never, most New Yorkers had never set foot in. And uh, it's still true probably that most New Yorkers have not set foot in it, but many more have set foot in it than ever, than ever have before. And part of that is because we have, you know, we. My goal, and I think we've executed it to a certain extent, is to break down the walls, the, the barriers, make it feel like a less elitist art form, because it really isn't. The only thing, the only barrier to opera is the languages and the length. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the thrill for an audience of seeing great performers like Joyce, um, you know, just letting it rip on stage. You know, this is the only art form in the world uh, of classical art form that, where there's no amplification, uh, there's no place to hide on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera. Let's emphasize, it's, no amplification. No amplification. You got that? You there's can, no microphone. You, you can't, can't believe the way they filled this place you up. Can't, you cannot succeed, in, you know, po there are pop singers who, who succeed for all different reasons. You cannot succeed on the stage of the Met or any big opera house or any small opera house if you can't sing. Uh, you have to be able to really sing in tune, and you have to be able to get out there. There's opera singers, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not saying this uh, just because Joyce is sitting next to me, but, but I, I believe that opera singers are the most courageous performers in the world. They get up on the stage of the Met in front of 3,800 people. Sometimes we have a live transmission to 2,000 movie theaters, like Joyce will be performing in front of us this, this coming Saturday. <laughs> this coming Saturday at uh, 1 o'clock, Joyce, who's singing the title role, where she's on stage most of the three and a half hours of this opera, singing, you know, it's like, it's like running, the vocal equivalent of running the marathon maybe twice. And uh, she will be on the stage with her co-stars, but uh, who are also brilliantly talented, and they will be, you know, singing their hearts out without any place to hide, and, and the whole world will be watching. Uh, in the opera house and in movie theaters everywhere else. And so, you know, for me, what I'm trying to do is, as, a, as the, uh, the curator of the Met, is to make sure that people understand how exciting and thrilling the art form is and to give them as many people as possible a chance to, to experience it. Because the world in which we live in today is very different than the world of, say, 20 or 30 years ago, where in public schools uh, people could learn about opera and classical music, uh, instruments were given to students, you know, all that stuff is, uh, is long behind us. So now we have to do the, the heavy lifting ourselves and get people to understand about opera and understand how exciting and thrilling it is. You, you said the, the only hurdles were language and time. What about cost, though? The tickets are very expensive. Your, your budget is more than $300 million a year, which is... I, I, I tried to figure this out online. The only other arts organization in the world that I think spends more money is the Qatari Museum, which spends a billion, so that's 700 million to go if you want. I mean, why is it so expensive? Well, the, the fact that it's so expensive um, is actually, it's our problem it's, it's, that we have to bear, and we, have to, and we do it with the help of donors who, who help make up the costs. The reason why it's so expensive is because there's so many people involved in the effort. You know, we have a full-time symphony orchestra, we have a full-time chorus, we have... Uh, we play four different operas in rotation every week uh, in, in, in uh, seven performances. 
So every night there's a different opera on the stage, and uh, it's a huge undertaking. It's, uh, one of my board members used to quote, I think incorrectly, Winston Churchill saying that the only undertaking more expensive than war is grand opera. Uh, so <laughs> the, the, but, but fortunately for the audience, you know, we're, we're not allowing this huge cost factor to get in the way of the audience being able to attend. We have tickets at priced as cheaply as, 10, as $20 for a performance. We also have $400 tickets. But uh, the fact is, I mean, any, just about any, anybody who goes to a, who can afford to go to a, a concert can afford to go to the opera. And, and the, and the movie, th event. And the movie theater tickets are, are, you know, on the average about $20. And it's very exciting for people to, to see the opera on a giant screen as well. I, th I think it's really important actually to reinforce this. It really, in the scale of things, is not that expensive. What's expensive is Beyonce tickets. Okay, that's expensive. And it's like, if you want the kind of tickets where you can like sit and like, like maybe become within 15 feet of the hem of her dress, it's really expensive. That's like a season of the And a lot of, of that Met. expense is for the microphone. <laughs> ah, well, a lot for of- For Beyonce, things, you know, not for the No, Met. it's for the, right, yeah. exactly. No, it's for, the, it's for the fans that blow the hair. But no, it's, but, it's, but really with opera, it's, even if you're buying the most expensive tickets that you can possibly buy, it, it really does pale in comparison to, to going to see like a big stadium show or to, to some sporting events. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's really not that crazy and it's so worth it. I wanted to underline something that he said, which is pretty unique of the Met, which is that most opera companies in the world, correct me if I'm wrong, say, okay, we're gonna do Traviata for the next two weeks, then we're gonna do Kevin Pog for the next two weeks, and then we're gonna do Don Giovanni for the next two weeks. No, at the Met, you see something different on Tuesday, that you see something different on Wednesday, which is different than Thursday, which is different than Friday, which is different than the Saturday night and A and Saturday night, right? right. I mean, that's, that's an incredible undertaking. Yes, that's what I inherited. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't invent that system. Do, but do, 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 you want to keep it, or would you prefer to go? Well, they, I think the, the, the core audience of the Met certainly would like us to keep it. Yes, I would. And uh, <laughs> so, you, so, you, so you can answer that yourself. I mean, what's, that's what's so exciting about the Met, in, in that every day, I mean, you know, when I go to work, there is um, not only is there a rehearsal on the stage of the Met. The Met is the busiest stage in the world. It's literally in 24-hour use. We have a rehearsal every morning on the stage that goes from about 10.30 to 2 or 2.30. And then the scenery has to be taken, taken down to make room for the evening's performance. So today, for example, on the main stage, we're rehearsing a, a revival of the opera Lucia, which features the most famous mad scene of all of opera. And then tonight, uh, while I'm sitting here, that scenery is being pushed off into a corner somewhere. The, uh, the stage of the Met is enormous. And, and we're preparing the sets for Manon, which is another opera that will be getting its premiere tonight. Meanwhile, in five or six different rehearsal rooms on different levels of the Met are all kinds of other rehearsals going on. Um, Joseph Kalea, the, uh, one of the great tenors from, from Malta, just flew and he had been sick, and so he joined the cast of Lucia in a separate musical rehearsal when I left. Um, and another, another floor, uh, uh, the young, uh, brilliant young conductor, Yannick uh, Nizet Sagan, who's the conductor of the, of the Philadelphia Orchestra, is conducting a rehearsal of uh, Don Carlo uh, with his cast. In another room, uh, we're rehearsing another opera. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, the, oh, we had the first rehearsal today for a new production of um, uh, this double bill of uh, two operas, uh, Cavalleria Rusticana and Pagliacci. And those two operas, uh, which can fill an evening, uh, are, are being presented in a new production that opens in six weeks. And the first rehearsal for that was today being directed by David McVicker with a wonderful cast of, of stars. So every, you know, the Met is just filled with all these great singers, all this great action, and uh, that in itself is, is for, for the people who work there, it's very, it's very exciting. Can, do you think you're gonna be able to maintain the level of spending required? I just, you know, Moody's downgraded the debt of, of the Met back in December. You raise 150 million a year, every year, from private individuals, which is an astounding amount of money, even for New York City, which is incredibly philanthropic. But at some point, do you have to cut the budget in some way? And, well, and would that trickle down to tickle pr well, ticket prices? We have to, you know, uh, the ticket prices, I mean, we feel are pretty, you know, because we have this broad range of ticket prices, I'm not, I, I can't look forward to a ticket price decrease. I mean, we're trying to stabilize ticket prices. The, the tickets for next season, as you pointed out, my 10th, are basically the same as they are this season. And uh, there's a price really point for anybody, for everybody, you know, who wants to go. The, uh, we, you know, last summer we had long uh, discussions with our unions to try to reduce our, our, our costs and, uh, 
I think the members of the company uh, all realize that we have to we have to lower our costs in order to keep the company healthy. So to, uh, we actually saved this year about $18 million in our budget between uh, cuts of the unionized employees, the management, and other savings. We're the Singers also took some cuts, right, I read? Some Singers took cuts. Uh, Joyce, Joyce took a volunteer to take a, a, a little cut, and uh, which was very generous of her. And um, uh, everybody's helping out and pitching in. But if, if, if I can tie some of this in that I think is really important to keep in mind, that a lot of the focus in, in the media and in, in talks around this is how expensive opera is. And great cases about comparing it to other things in popular culture. But there's a couple things that are really important to remember in this mix. Number one, everybody Peter's talking about at that opera house is the most highly trained person in their field from singers to orchestra members to administration to stagehands to costume people to wig and makeup. They are the best at their job in opera. You cannot survive in this field without being at the best. The best carries a certain value. When I look at the Olympics and I see a figure skater or Usain Bolt, I see the best in the world at what they do there is value to that. Then we mix in the fact that what we're doing on that stage is not just pageantry and pomp and circumstance. We are bringing, I'm very passionate about this, so we are bringing truth and beauty, I mean deep truth about the human condition and beauty to the world. When you talk about Jimmy Levine dropping the downbeat to Le Nozze di Figaro, we're connecting the genius of Mozart, the genius of perhaps his greatest opera, the genius of the greatest conductor in the world dropping the downbeat, the genius of 70 people, the best in the world on their instruments playing it, and a cast of eight to 10 singers and chorus, the best in the world, all unamplified. And they're talking about love. And they're talking about deception and honesty. And they're talking about equality. This is valuable. This is, of course, relevant. This is worth fighting for. And it takes the people that scrounge together to spend $20 and stand up in the nosebleeds and dream of 15 years down the road when they can maybe move to Family Circle. It involves the dreaming of the chairman of the board who gives an unspeakably generous amount of money, all the mid-level donors. It involves us continuing to fight for it. This isn't just about preserving the Met or opera. It's so much bigger than that. And this is why people fight for it. San Diego Opera almost went under and the community went, oh, hell no. That's right. They said, hell no. And it's here, and they're doing a new work this season. When you talk about the passion, it reminds me of, and I saw it as a positive, even though maybe you saw it as a negative, you've had protesters and protests about operas that you've mounted recently. You had, uh, when Putin was, the situation with uh, Ukraine, and you had a very Russian opera, you had a Russian singer, a Russian conductor, a Russian opera, and you had protesters about it. You had a protester right in the auditorium, and people were upset about it, and yet I saw it as something that speaks to how relevant an art form it is that people are so, <laughs> that they're willing to protest about it means that it mattered. Yeah, one of my board members suggested I put up that Ukrainian uh, protester to run across the stage of the Met to, to, to get attention. Yeah, to get publicity, <laughs> right? All publicity, it's publicity. Genius. <laughs> it's, it's not true. The, uh, no, sir, you know, I mean, I, you know, I believe in uh, the artistic freedom of artistic organizations, and, and we have to, you know, one of the, uh, I guess, a collateral uh, damage for the Met is that because we are so international, because we have singers and performers, the best performers from all over the world, we're very fortunate that Joyce and, and Nico live right here. Uh, or, you don't live in the city, though, do you? Uh, kind of. <laughs> Between here in Kansas City when you sing at the World Series. But uh, the, um, 
you know, we, we bring the greatest artists in the world to, to the Met. And, uh, you know, they, unfortunately, when Valery Gergiev uh, uh, was conducting and Anna Netrebko, our, uh, soprano, our great soprano star, were performing in this Tchaikovsky opera, the Ukrainians um, uh, decided to protest. Um, you know, the, uh, the, I think a more interesting and, and uh, uh, relevant protest was the, uh, the whole thing that happened over the death of Klinghoffer, the opera by John Adams that we put on. Um, which was a really interesting, I think, uh, uh, example of, of how, how much misunderstanding there is in the world today. When, when you consider that this opera, which is a highly sympathetic portrayal of the victims, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Klinghoffer, uh, was being protested for, uh, as, as being some kind of a Palestinian tract, which it wasn't, but nobody who was protesting had actually read about the, had read the libretto or had seen the opera, or very few of them had, I don't think. And uh, in the end of the day, I think the Met was vindicated for putting on this great work uh, by a composer who uh, has led the way for other, you know, I mean, he has been one of the great composers of American composers who has made it possible, I think, for opera companies to have, having seen the success they had with John Adams, and we've done three of his works, it has paved the way for Nico and other and other uh, younger composers to have their shot today. How did, how did you all get involved in opera? Why don't, why don't you? Why don't well, you I'm start? curious. <laughs> I want to ask you the same question, actually, too. But I, I had a great um, high school experience, and I was in musicals, and I had ah, Godspell, and I went to college to be a music teacher because I thought that was. Ex I knew 100 percent that I was going to be a high school choral teacher, and. I, my junior year in college, I got an extra $250 a semester in scholarship money, which was gold, to join the opera chorus. And I did. And the fall opera was Deflator Mouse. And I sang in the chorus because I couldn't get cast to save my life. Um, and I fell in love. And I was hooked. It's one thing to go from the chorus to the stage of the Met. I mean, how did... It was about a 15-year process. Uh -huh. But <laughs> I was a slow, I was a slow <laughs> developer. <laughs> Nico, how about you? It was for me, the, it was, I actually, the first opera I ever saw was in a small town in Switzerland, and it was, it was The Marriage of Figaro. And I must have been seven or eight years old, and it's, the first time you see an opera, it's really crazy. Because you, you, it, it, it is like nothing else, and yet it's like everything at the same time. Even when you're seven, you, you realize that something special is occurring. Um, and I'd listened to a ton of opera, and in fact, I think part of the reason I love it so much is because I didn't see a lot of live opera until I moved to New York. Um, and my relationship with it was this sort of obsessive score study and, and recordings. And, you know, it was, it was in that way that I, that I sort of fell in love with, with, with Wagner and with John Adams and with, and with all these different, you know, wonderful, wonderful pieces. And then the first time you see it live, it's as if, you know, you, you really, you, it's as if you've been blind and all of a sudden you can see. It's, it's this extraordinary moment. And I, I feel like once, it is in a weird way a one-way street. Like once you get bitten by it, you never quite, you can never quite put it down again. Um, I'm, as I'm sure you found, where it's like you, you, you think, well, this is going to be part of my life forever now. <laughs> yeah. yes. Well, I, I was, uh, I grew up in New York. I was a teenage usher part time at the Met uh, when I was 15 years old, and I fell in love with with the Met and opera then because I heard the greatest performers of that period, uh, Renato Tabaldi and Franco Corelli and Leontine Price, all these legendary artists, and. Uh, you know, to be inside the Met, uh, which to me was the most glamorous, exciting theater I'd ever been in. I, I, my father was a drama critic when I was a kid, and so I got to, taken to a lot of shows uh, in New York. I went to the theater all the time. Um, but to see it all come together musically at the Met was very exciting for me. And then I pursued a career in the performing arts, and uh, one day I uh, got drafted. Into, into the Met. Into the Met. He, he mentioned his father real briefly. I didn't realize he was a, a drama critic at first. Well, he was, my father spent his, who, who died uh, last May at the age of 90, uh, was uh, a lifetime New York Times uh, 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 employee. He started as a copy boy and ended up as a managing editor. But, uh, he and did had, he end up at the Council on Foreign Relations? No, that, you're thinking of uh, Leslie Gelb. Who was who the same name? This is Arthur Gelb. And, no kidding. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I've Leslie Gelb worked, the Leslie Gelb worked for my father. I see. <laughs> okay. Got it. All right. but, you know, one, one thing I, I'm sorry, I just want to say one thing about what Joy said about the, the gap between her singing in the chorus and, and becoming a big star. You know, this is where opera is different than uh, pop singers. Um, because to become an opera star, 
to be an opera singer, to be able to sing without the aid of a, of a microphone is not something that just naturally comes to you. It, it is a, it's the, the opera singers are like great athletes, or they are athletes, they're vocal athletes, and they have to learn how to use their entire bodies to be able to produce sound on a stage like the Met. So typically, an opera singer doesn't even hit the stage of the Met to, to audition even until they're in their, in their mid or late 20s. And, and an opera star hits his or her prime in their 30s or 40s. My debut was 35. I was over the hill for a debut at the Met. But Michelle, how did you get into opera? A, a friend of mine invited me, and uh, I was like, wow, this is great. <laughs> what, was, what was the first opera? Um, actually, the very first night was uh, the send-off for Volpe. It was my very my, first night at the opera. Prede my predecessor. Right, exactly. The gala. That was six hours of opera. <laughs> <laughs> We sat That's down to dinner at 11.30. One, <laughs> one of my, my life's greatest pleasures is taking people to their first opera, too, and I, yeah. I, make, it a point to, I make it a point to do it as, as often as I can. And whenever there's something that I, that I know people I, whom I know would love, I just buy, like, a block of tickets. Like, when, when Satya Graha, which is this opera by Philip Glass, was at the Met, I went absolutely nuts, and I spent all my money, and I, I brought everyone I knew. <laughs> was, yeah. But, you know, you think... It, it, you want to proselytize, for sure, yeah. We, I don't want to give the wrong impression, though. Operas are not six hours long. No. The, uh, so, so, <laughs> so you should all know that. In fact, I, since I've been at the Met, I've tried to make operas shorter by pulling intermissions out of them. Uh, so I'd say the average opera is about three hours. We have questions from the audience, I believe, right? Hi, my name's Karen. Uh, Mr. Gelb, do you have any plans in the future to ever sprinkle in some AGMA actors like Lyric Opera of Chicago does? Well, you know, because New York is the, um, the home of Broadway, we are, we're less, uh, we're not interested in, in so much in putting on musicals. Because, I mean, what Chicago does is they put on, uh, you know, they put on every year a big musical like Showboat or The Sound of Music. Um, we, I'm sorry? Well, we hire actors too. I mean, you know, we have actors, we have, we have actors in, uh, we just had actors in The Merry Widow, which we put on. So we do hire actors, but uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand your question. But we definitely, we definitely do hire actors. 10 years at the Met, what's the next 10 years like after the first? The next 10 years will be much easier, I'm sure. Uh, the, uh, the next 10 years, well, f the, the biggest ch challenge I think that I have is, besides the economic one, is to get new audiences for opera, to gain new audiences for opera. So with the help of my, my uh, colleagues and cohorts here and all of their creativity and all the creativity we can harness from around the world, we're going to keep going at it, you know, and trying to... You know, we know that when people come to the Met for the first time, they, they typically fall in love with it. And, uh, you know, so we, make, we try to make sure that every experience, every one of those four operas that rotates each week, that every one of those operas is something that somebody who's never seen opera before um, hopefully could really get a kick out of and enjoy. And that's why we bring directors, you know, uh, from all over the world who typically work on Broadway or the West End or... Um, you know, Bart Scher, for example, who's directing our new production of Otello that opens next season, is, is directing a revival of The King and I next door at Lincoln Center Theater right now. So we're trying to, you know, and, and he's just one of, of, of dozens of stage directors who love and believe in this art form and working with these great singers. You know, singers like Joyce uh, didn't exist as, as uh, obviously Joyce never existed before, but, uh, <laughs> but, the idea that, that singers today, opera singers today, not only are technically able to you know, go out there and hit these kind of operatic home runs, but also are theatrically totally tuned in to the story of the opera, that they are, you know, they are great actors. Um, and these directors who are used to working with great actors wouldn't work at the Met unless the singers were equal in terms of their acting ability. So what, what opera is today, modern opera experience today, whether it's a new piece by Nico or La Traviata or Rigoletto or Donna Del Lago, which Joyce is singing in this, this uh, uh, Saturday and tomorrow night as well, uh, it's all about being an a, a incredible theatrical musical experience that, that uh, really... And so my, my job is to make sure people know that and have a chance to experience it so they can get hooked. Questions from the audience? Go ahead. Hi. Um, What's your name? My name's Lloyd Knight. 
Um, this question is for you, Peter. Um, I'm a dancer for the Martha Graham Dance Company, and the past, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the past few years, we've been trying to connect more with the audiences and trying to make it more accessible. And I was wondering, when did that point come for you, and what are you trying to do to make it more accessible to the audience? Well, um, basically, I've spent my whole career, before I came to the Met, working on, in classical music, trying to connect the art form to people in a broader sense. So, you know, everything we do at the Met basically is about to making it more accessible. We, met, we talked about some of these, these ideas earlier, but, you know, we have this rush ticket program, for example, where for $20, you not only can, you can get an actually a seat in the orchestra, uh, where we have a limited n number of tickets available every day so that people can actually get a prime seat in the, or in the orchestra. We put on uh, family entertainment offerings of opera during the holidays where uh, we take operas that are longer and make them shorter and translate them into English, like our English Magic Flute, or next season we're doing an English Barber of Seville. Um, and, and you'd be amazed if you went to the Met uh, during, during the holidays uh, for one of these shows, the entire audience is full of, of kids as well as their parents. As a performer, no offense to the you know, opening night gala guests and HD thing, the best performances to do are dress rehearsals where the kids that are, all different schools are invited, or these evening performances that's for kids because they scream like we're rock stars. And, it, and they get it. And they're listening with fresh ears. They don't know if the tenor's going to get the girl. They don't know that Mimi's candle's going to blow out. They're like, ooh, her candle went out. Was it on purpose? Those are the most thrilling audiences, and those kids are hooked. And they boo the bad guys. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the guy That's right. comes out and carry boo. That's right. I've, I've had to explain to singers in dre these dress rehearsals, which are f packed with kids, when they, when they get booed at the end, it's not because they didn't perform well. It's just because it was, it was the evil character they were portraying. So in character, the kids <laughs> love it, yeah. And I, I just want to, I should add that you know, what, what Peter's saying is it's not, about, it's not about changing the work to make the work more accessible. It's about really just making, making the work that goes into the work more visible. And, and, sort of, and sort of showing that this is an amazing thing. It's not, so again, it's, it's not like you know, you're being, uh, the, it's not like the operas that are being presented are, are, are being kind of dumbed down or, or it's, it's about you know, not presenting challenging work as we, as we can see from, from you know, the death of Klinghoffer, which is one of the most challenging things or even you know, the, this sort of perverse thing that I wrote. Um, there's, there's really, there's really the, the mission is about getting people to focus and look at the unbelievable energy that it takes to make a place like that work and, and the, the energy that it, that it takes to get singers to sort of radiate that from stage. It's an amazing thing. And I'll, I'll put a little bit in there too because this, going back to the, the enormity of this art form, it's not just up to administration to make it accessible. It's not just up to the artists. It's also up to the audience. You guys actually, because you love this, the audience has a kind of responsibility as well. And I think the biggest thing is exactly what got you in, being inviting somebody. Peter is inviting people to come to the movie theater, inviting people to buy $20 rush tickets. We're inviting people by tweeting saying, ah, tune in to AOL Build in 20 minutes. Invite somebody. Save up and bring somebody, especially a kid or an older person. I know a lot of people in their 70s going, how did I not know this world existed until now? I don't have enough time to catch up and learn. So the public actually, you guys, we're all in this together. We all have to sort of... Yeah, we, we have to all be ambassadors for it. Yeah. And, we have to, and we have to constantly say, this is really great and it's, it's worth... It's worth fighting for. It's worth being casual about. It's worth being formal about. It's worth all the things that anything that you cherish, um, you know, it, it should should be. And we're, you know, uh, we have a whole bunch of initiatives to to make to bring it to the people. I mean, we have a opening night is transmitted live into Times Square. Uh, we have a ten night festival in the summer where we take our live what have been our live transmissions to movie theaters and show them on a giant screen on the on the front of the met uh, with 3000 seats free free to the public so you know we're constantly constantly looking for ways to engage the public and make opera available and accessible for them to have a chance to to check it out last question 
I wonder if somebody like Baz Lorman might attract a younger crowd and also using the latest stage technologies. Well, you know, I uh, spent many hours trying to, get, trying to get Baz Lerman on the phone to talk about directing an opera at the Met, but uh, so far he hasn't answered. Do you want me to call him for you? Yeah. I'm just please, kidding. Please, I'm just... please, please. Um, he hasn't called you back, really. No, he never called me back. I don't know. So Baz, I think dude. I think I think that yeah, uh, you, you know he he directed an opera which was a, uh, which played on Broadway, which is a production of La Boheme. Um, which was terrific, and uh, you know he's he's definitely a great a great director. I'd love for him to work at the Met, um, and we use technology. When we did the Ring Cycle of Robert Lepage a few years ago, you know it, we were putting on technology on the stage in terms of infrared uh, sensors and uh, vo vocal tra scenery that tracked voices, all kinds of stuff that had never had never been used on the stage before anywhere. So uh, we're interested in, in technology, harnessing technology for the sake of art. But also, you know, it's, I should just, just add one thing. You, you know, young people are, are smarter than moths, right? It's not like, you, it's not like they're like, oh, I like that director, I'm going to go to the Met. Right? It's more complicated than that. And, and luring a young audience, I'm always, I'm always nervous as a younger person at the Met that, that there's this sense that, you, that there's some sort of trickery to it, right? It's like, it's like leaving like a honey trap out, um, which of course is not how it works. And, and sometimes you see young people there who are, who are there for the stodgiest old productions. And sometimes young people, you know, there, there's, we there's we no, don't have any stodgy production. Exactly. But, but there, there's, no, there's no reason why a, a young person, when the curtain comes up in La Boheme, and it's like everyone's there, and the donkey's there, and the snow is falling, that, that is as enticing, um, I think, as, as, and that can be and should be as enticing as something that's using like crazy technology and, and everyone's you know, hanging, hanging from their feet, and et cetera. The, the longer I'm in this business, the one thing I'm sure of is our strength undoubted, unfiltered strength lies in doing what we do and, and doing that better than anybody and not trying to morph into something that we're not. Because then we're watered down, and then it's just stupid, quite honestly. It's really watered down opera. It's just really kind of stupid. But when we're out there with all guns blazing, and it can be traditional, it can be modern, it can be um, with elephants on the stage, or I guess I should say horses on the stage, no, long, no more elephants, um, or it can be a very minimal set. It's the music, the drama, the emotion. That's what we do better than anything, and that's where our strength lies. Thanks so much for doing this. It's been a real honor. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having Thanks. us.